Okay, uh, hey there. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome again to another lecture of Hempology 101. Um, <laughs> thanks for tracking us down here on the lawn. It was kind of a, a borderline day to be outside, but uh, any chance we get, we're going to be out here. And so hopefully the weather next week will be nice as well. We have our first guest speaker of the year coming next week, uh, Cam Burge, who's the coordinator of the Sensible BC campaign, uh, basically here in the lower part of the island. And so he's going to be talking about pot and politics and uh, why he's involved in, in this campaign and, and what's happening with Sensible BC. Again, hopefully the weather will hold out for us for, for at least one more week. But otherwise we do have a cinecentic book. And so uh, today's subject is uh, the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. And uh, for some people this might be dry history, but for those of us that, that love this plant, uh, this is a very important history to know because we're fighting prohibition today and uh, many people don't understand the history. They think we're fighting prohibition because of the plant that we smoke or the, the drugs that other people consume. And really prohibition is more about economic control of the marketplace. Uh, since governments were created a few hundred years ago, uh, various special interest groups have used this, these institutions as a way to control who enters into the marketplace what they can sell and how they can sell it. And really, the, the government, per se, was created by the rich to take power away from the church and the monarchy. And it was mostly guilds and rich families that hired lawyers to run government. That, that was what government, for the most part, has been. And uh, in, in this particular case, we, we bore the brunt of that. But before I get into the, the Marijuana Tax Act, I'm, I'm going to go back into some history and uh, also even start with something about the plant itself because you have to know a little bit about cannabis to understand why it was prohibited. Again, not because of the smoke, but because of the, the clothes I'm wearing, the food that I eat, the fuel that I'd like to use in my car, and many, many more things. And so the, the cannabis plant, as, as I described in, in the lecture last week, uh, is a very versatile plant. fiber on the outside, like a lot of other plants, and then there's the cork, or the herds it's called, on the inside. And uh, one of the historical problems with cannabis is that it is such a strong fiber that it's been very hard uh, to break down uh, at times. Now, commercial processes have been developed over times, but historically, um, it would be really hard to uh, cut down the plant and then you would basically smash it uh, after it dried a little bit to try to separate the fiber from the cork and then you could use the fiber to weave into rope or clothing um, or other uh, products. But the herds, the cork in the middle, had very few uses. But the only use before last century of herds was for uh, bedding in uh, animal stables, you know, horses and pigs and stuff, because it would suck up moisture very good and, and clean up uh, stables. And as I said last week, it's antifungal, antibacteria, uh, helps uh, keep bugs away, so it would be really good to use in uh, people's uh, animals' uh, homes for their bedding. Um, but historically, all the uses that you hear about cannabis, for the most part, come either from the leaves, the seed, or the fiber, not much from the herds at all. Um, but the, the herds play a, a really huge role in, in the plant. But when we started to develop fabric you know, um, in, in China a couple thousand years ago, and, and paper, uh, again, it was predominantly the fiber that was used. And uh, we have woven so much uh, with hemp that, in fact, the word canvas uh, is rooted in cannabis, right? Like the, the old canvas that was developed, the, the hardest uh, fabric that we would use um, in not only sails for sailboats, but for you know living uh, quarters and you know pretty much any time we wanted to make strong fabric in the past, we would use the, the cannabis hemp plant because while it was really tough and hard to, to break down, 
once you did weave it into something, it would be you know the most protective, strongest kind of fiber that, that we could use. And so when we started to develop uh, the ability to sail a couple thousand years ago, um, one of the really important things for these big empires, starting even with the Celts, right, because the Celts used to have uh, huge sailboats, um, kind of going off a little bit, but there's an a ancient story of the Celts fighting um, Roman, uh, the Roman Navy when Julius Caesar was in charge, and, and they were vastly outnumbered by these Celtic sailboats that were three times as large as the, the Roman trimeres. Um, but the, the wind died in the Mediterranean Sea, and, and uh, the trimeres were able to take down boat by boat because they couldn't sail. So the, the Celts were using canvas and hemp actually for, for thousands of years, um, not as a psychoactive product at all though, but just for the fiber, just so that they could uh, grow uh, hemp and, and make really good fiber. In fact, the Netherlands has actually been uh, one of the uh, traditional places for hemp to be grown um, and, and made into canvas and other products. They uh, wanted to have their own supply of hemp. That was really important because uh, hemp, while it lasts longer than any other fiber, especially for rope, for sailing boats, um, it only lasts for so many years and then you got to replace it. And uh, these sailboats would use mass amounts of uh, rope and uh, other materials. There's a quote here in uh, or a, a famous picture in Jack Hare's book, uh, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, and they have a picture of the USS Constitution where they estimate there are 60 tons of hemp on this one boat alone between the rope, the sailing, uh, uh, the sails, the uh, the riggings, the, the uh, clothing that the men wore, you know, the, that they uh, would use uh, hemp, uh, I guess, seed products to help uh, glue the, the boats together, but 60 tons of hemp on, on one boat alone. And so historically, being able to have access to inexpensive, high-quality hemp was a, a really important thing. And uh, there's been wars actually fought over the access to uh, good hemp. Uh, in fact, when Napoleon was trying to uh, invade Russia, or sorry, invade uh, Britain, in order to undermine the British arm or British Navy. He decided that it was his best interest to actually burn down all the Russian hemp fields because the British were getting cheap hemp from Russia. And so uh, the um, Napoleon's army invaded Russia, burned down the, the hemp fields, or as many as they could, to the point where Russia stopped exporting hemp uh, to Britain. And so what Britain did was turn around and actually start to tax the American colonies more in hemp. And uh, hemp has uh, been one of the, the first crops grown in the American colonies. It was one of the most important because obviously they needed sails and ropes to go back and forth. Um, but the British were very controlling and they didn't actually let any uh, processing factories you know, kind of pop up in, in uh, the American states. Um, but they actually passed a law that made it uh, illegal not to grow hemp in certain areas of the United States in the early 1800s. And you could pay your taxes in hemp as well. And so uh, growing hemp was uh, very important for the uh, agricultural communities. And uh, they started to tax the hemp so much and demand so much hemp that that was in fact part of the American Revolution was in, in the higher taxes and that all the, the good hemp was being taken so the British could, could fight their, their wars uh, in Europe, but it wasn't being put to good use in America. Because what they wanted to use the hemp for in America wasn't so much for sailboats, but for the canvas wagons that were uh, shipping people across the United States. And so uh, the, the hemp was, was really critical to the founding of America and its economies, not just with contributing to, to sailing, but to obviously the, the uh, rope and canvas that was being used to, to settle uh, the uh, United States. Uh, it, was, it was really important. In fact, uh, several states became very famous for growing hemp. Uh, Kentucky, uh, by far the most. Um, I couldn't find it today, but I got a, a really wonderful uh, century-old book about the Kentucky hemp fields. And uh, they grew uh, many different kinds of, of hemp, but uh, they uh, grew a lot of it. And uh, 
that was uh, a really important part of the economy. However, by the, the late 1800s, uh, hemp was being used less and less. Um, there was different competitors coming in that were chipping away at the hemp uh, marketplace. Um, one of the most notable is the cotton industry, which has always been in, in competition with hemp. And uh, the cotton industry, you know, really plays into this story at, at a few points. And so, the uh, uh, even under slavery, even after slavery, it was still relatively cheap to produce cotton um, compared to hemp. Partly because there was no good machinery coming out to process hemp, but they came up with the cotton gin, which really, uh, I forget what year it came out, but it really improved the production of, of cotton and uh, its use. And so uh, different you know, investments were being made into the cotton industry that, that really were being made into the hemp industry. Um, plus there was other uh, export markets and, and fabrics that were competing with hemp. Um, also, uh, hemp paper um, was uh, starting to be uh, used less in favor of wood pulp paper um, in, in Europe where you know, trees were a lot more rare, uh, cutting down trees to use for paper was very practical, so growing hemp was a really uh, good way to, to have uh, paper being produced. Um, but when they moved to America, there were just so many trees that it just seemed to be cheaper and easier to just cut trees down and just chip them up and, and turn them into paper. It just made more economic sense to them. You don't have to pay farmers, you don't have to pay equipment, um, it costs more money for the, the chemicals and the process. But uh, certainly um, the introduction of uh, cheap wood pulp paper uh, also affected the growing and, and use of hemp. But the other thing that, that also uh, changed, uh, the, the thing that changed uh, o over those years uh, as well was the uh, use of hemp in food. Um, as I said last week, historically we, we used to eat a lot of hemp seed. Um, in fact, uh, gruel, you may have heard of gruel historically, you know, through uh, different uh, depressions and, and periods of uh, poverty. Uh, gruel is actually hemp seed, basically. And they would just cook hemp seed uh, until it was soft enough to eat. And they would throw in a few other things to try to make it taste good, because honestly a bowl of cooked hemp seed wouldn't taste that great. Um, but you could mix in a few other things, a few oats or whatever, uh, and, and you could make it uh, uh, go down. In, in fact, uh, historically, it's kind of funny because apparently um, in, in times where it was really poor, the ones who ate the most gruel were um, either nuns or um, uh, men uh, living in, uh, I'm forgetting the term now, but uh, it's not priests, but um, when uh, they're, they're, they're religious people that uh, would eat it three times a day would actually be healthier than the general population. Um, and so gruel was, was actually you know, hemp seed. And, but in the 1800s, hemp seed was eaten less and less because it was seen as a poor person's food, that only poor people ate. You know, hemp seed that they would eat meat obviously you know even today meat is seen as being eaten by the rich um, and uh, things like seeds and nuts uh, aren't really uh, uh, highly sought after and, 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 but uh, in the 1800s there was less and less hemp seed being eaten as well so so that use of the plant was being used less um, and so uh, in, into the 1900s, um, hemp was, was still being used for a variety of different products. Um, and there's a lot of farmers that, that still firmly believed in it. It's such a quick growing plant and, and such a, a wonderful plant to have. But a few things happened that um, changed the, the picture. The, the first was, um, uh, and, and both of them actually, uh, ironically, at first were in hemp's favor. Um, first thing that happened was the herbs invention uh, was made to turn herbs into paper. And so suddenly something that was thrown out could be turned into a useful product that um, was actually uh, easier to, to produce into paper than the fiber. And so um, in 1916 this uh, uh, an invention or process was announced. Um, and that was uh, the same year 
that George Splitskin invented what was called the decorticator. Now, the decorticator was basically a big combine that could go into a hemp field, cut it down, um, munch it up so that it would separate the fiber from the, the herds in the center. And uh, in one side, you would end up with this beautiful fiber that could be easily woven into to clothing and canvas. And then uh, on the other side, you'd end up with this big bucket of, of herds, uh, or, or again, like kind of cork-like material that uh, would be very quickly and easily turned into uh, high-quality paper. Um, between these two different uh, you know, kind of inventions, the hemp plant suddenly became a hundred times more valuable to farmers. Um, uh, before that, again, it was, it was a very intensive process to harvest hemp. Uh, a lot of it was, was even still done by hand or very uh, you know, crude equipment or the, the plants, like in the 1800s, a lot of the times they would stoke them, like you, know, you see done with grain, and they'd go into the field and, and cut it all by hand and then they would pile it up and just kind of let it dry there and then at some point later they tried to, to break it up using different kinds of machinery. Um, it was it was not easy work. It was backbreaking work really and uh, something that, that was quite difficult. So this decorticator and then all of a sudden you could again you know turn a waste product into to money. Uh, it was worth a hundred times more all of a sudden to, to farmers. And you would think that those two inventions alone would have turned the corner and hemp would have become really popular. But by 1916, a number of economic forces had really gained control in, in America. And uh, the first to find out about this new decorticator and this new wood pulp, or this, sorry, this new hemp pulp uh, paper production process were newspaper companies, right? Because they're reporting the news, right? And so uh, it's hard to, to pin down exactly Scripps Newspaper Company in San Diego was among the first to report on the decorticator. Someone from that company arranged to meet with George, and apparently uh, someone from that organization bought a patent from George to mass-produce decorticators. Well, that plan never happened. In fact, there's some speculation that they went as far as actually building a, a fake factory that they told George, oh yeah, we're, we're building decorticators, we're having some troubles getting them off the line, but, but we're doing it, just don't worry about it. Um, but that wasn't in the plans at all, those machines never went off the factory line. And the uh, process to turn uh, hemp pulp into to paper was really never widely circulated either. And the newspaper companies and uh, essentially Wall Street, behind closed doors, started talking about eliminating hemp from the marketplace and how to go about doing that in order to eliminate the competition. It was pure and simple uh, economics to them. And uh, it wasn't the first time that, that they'd done something like this. This has really been a grand experiment that, that's had uh, a, a lot of negative side effects. So the first uh, companies, the Scripps Newspaper Company, had also just heavily invested, along with the Hearst Newspaper Company, in timber in the southwest of the United States. They, they paid pennies to the American government for the ability to go in and just mow down trees as fast as they could and, and turn it into paper or whatever products they wanted. But um, they just had invested a, a fair amount of money in these uh, new uh, paper, wood pulp paper production facilities. And so uh, they weren't interested in, in advertising the competition, to be sure, quite the opposite. Now, uh, William Hearst, uh, Rudolf William Hearst, I believe is his name, uh, was the owner of the Hearst Newspaper Company, who, uh, uh, again, was part of this, this uh, conglomerate uh, of businesses and rich people. Um, and uh, William Hearst uh, played a key role, not just because he was pushing these uh, issues in the newspapers, um, but he actually apparently invented the word marijuana, uh, kind of using some slang that he uh, picked up from in, in Mexico. And uh, no one else had ever heard of the word marijuana before. Uh, before, uh, I think it was 19... 
1919, I think, was the first time marijuana was used in public. Before that time, people knew what cannabis was. Cannabis indica was uh, used in medicines, like the tincture that Queen Victoria used was a cannabis indica tincture. So doctors uh, still, in 1916, widely used cannabis indica. But the doctors in the medical community read about this new drug, marijuana. And back in 1916, you know, people had a somewhat naive uh, understanding of the world, and the world was still being discovered in some ways. So to find out that there's this new drug coming out of Mexico, this new plant that people are smoking, wouldn't, wouldn't have surprised anybody. It's like, yeah, of course the Mexicans are smoking something, right? So. Um, the, uh, the the idea that, uh, that there, there was some sort of dangerous plant drug in, in Mexico uh, wasn't uh, a, a surprise. In fact, a lot of people back then were really quite racist. So to, to come up with very uh, negative, uh, uneducated opinions uh, about people from other lands was was very common. It was it was easy and, and very uh, accepted, unfortunately. And so William Hearst and, and his uh, you know, newspaper company and invented this term marijuana and started printing these horror stories uh, about the, the effects of it. Um, there's one really famous quote, uh, didn't dig it up, but uh, from a, uh, a police chief in the United States, in some, I think in Los Angeles, where uh, he's quoted as saying that people that smoke this marijuana drug go on these murderous, raping rampages and, and uh, do all these horrific things. Uh, no documentation or proof of, of any of these accusations, but uh, the, the newspaper put them out in print and no one challenged them, and, and many of these stories were just reprinted over and over again. Again, no substantive collaborating evidence, just news stories being printed. Again, there, there weren't a lot of media back then, and people believed what they were told. And so, uh, the, the, and on the other hand, uh, everybody knew about hemp, you know, everybody knew uh, what hemp clothing was, everybody knew what hemp seed was, that's something that has been around for, for millennia. So, you know, when they came out with this marijuana drug that people were smoking, well, none of the hemp farmers tweaked into the fact that it was a, a cousin of what they were growing in their fields. And uh, no one in the government was, was saying anything like that. Certainly no one in the media was, was tying in this marijuana drug with the cannabis medicines we all knew, or the, the hemp plants. It was just this new drug. And so, with the uh, introduction of, of marijuana, um, the uh, number of companies and industries that were interested in prohibiting hemp grew. And so, you know, it's, it's really quite speculative on who connected with, with, with who first. But we do know that the key player in the prohibition of marijuana is a man known as Andrew Mellon. Now, Andrew Mellon isn't as well known as some of the other players, but he is the man responsible for the prohibition of cannabis today. I, I firmly believe that. I can't tie in exactly when he became involved in, in this campaign, but certainly uh, he, he was there from the beginning. Uh, he made his money um, in uh, chemicals and banking. I think it, it wasn't the Bank of America, but another really important early bank in the United States was uh, one that he founded. He was also the uh, sort of treasurer of DuPont Chemicals. I think it was with DuPont Chemicals that he really rose uh, up in uh, the corporate world. And so DuPont Chemicals was one of the companies selling a lot of uh, pulp paper uh, materials, right? Because the production of wood pulp uses a lot of chemicals. So uh, protecting that industry was really important to DuPont. Protecting the cotton industry was also really important to DuPont. Uh, cotton uses a lot of chemicals. I'm not sure if it's still 50% of the chemicals produced in the United States, but at one point uh, it was, uh, or for decades, you know, at least half the chemicals in the U.S. were used in either the production of clothing made from cotton or in the pesticides and fertilizers uh, that are used in growing it. It just sucks up massive amounts of chemicals. So DuPont was, was very heavily tied in. And, and I didn't mention this, but the, the cotton farmers had a, a few reasons to hate hemp, uh, at least in their puny little minds. Um, and it wasn't just because it competed with their cotton, but uh, cotton farmers traditionally uh, were slave owners and had a very negative opinion of people of color. And, but many of those 
cotton farmers actually allowed slaves to grow hemp. They're not just hemp, they grew hemp for their rope. But the, the slaves would actually grow cannabis marijuana in their gardens. And they would be able to, in many cases, smoke it and eat it and use it uh, freely on the plantation. And in those farms, it was found that they were healthier, stronger, lived longer, you know, happier, you know, even though they were slaves, uh, it, it contributed to a better farm. So uh, it was known through the through slavery that, you know, letting your your uh, your, your slaves grow a little bit of, of cannabis, uh, you know, indica it was, was a good thing. Um, but when the slaves got free, the, the cotton farmers really, really resented the fact that they were free and that they were using cannabis freely or doing anything freely, like playing jazz music or having fun at all. That just didn't uh, um, sit well with them for whatever strange reason. And so the cotton farmers you know, had a real hate on for, for cannabis in general. So that's one, one of the main reasons that they bought it. And so, uh, yeah, Andrew Mellon was, was working with the cotton farmers, DuPont Chemicals. General Motors was the other one that he was really working with, and Gulf Oil. And so uh, a lot of people don't understand how uh, Gulf Oil fits into this and General Motors um, and all this sort of uh, military-industrial complex, but really Andrew Mellon was one of the individuals and people that helped sponsor the Nazi party in, in Germany, for example. Uh, off on a side tangent, but General Motors had written agreements with the American government not to bomb their tank factories in Germany because they were General Motors tank factories building them uh, for the German army. And so uh, we, that's why they were pumping out tanks from the very end because they were General Motors uh, factories. So General Motors has got a, a lot of influence with the, the government in the United States. And uh, the other um, you know, thing that, that happened that many people don't know about is, is around fossil fuels and, uh, and, and, and what we know as biofuels. When Rudolf Diesel built the diesel engine, it was made for vegetable fuels. It was not made for, for what we know of now as diesel fuel, uh, which is, is ironic that they would name the, 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 the bad fuel after him when he was trying to promote the use of, of veggie fuels. And so um, the diesel engines that we use today, it really doesn't take much to convert it to using a, a veggie fuel. Um, and hopefully more and more of us will be converting to that. But back in the early 1900s, we didn't have the huge kind of economy in the automobile industry that we have. And they were really developing these things. But there were some people using biofuel technology and biofuels and, and their diesel engines. And uh, other people were using these uh, fossil fuels that were being extracted from the ground. And there was a lot of competition between these two. Well, um, it, it's not as, as clear as, as, as it might be to, to some of us, but um, there's a lot of reasons that alcohol was prohibited. I believe it's 1919 that the United States government prohibited alcohol. And many of us believe that one of the main reasons for alcohol prohibition was to actually stop farmers from making their own biofuels because it made uh, having a still on your farm illegal. And so a lot of farmers stopped making their own uh, biofuels at that point. But not all of them. Some of them switched over to seed crops because with hemp seed, you, you literally just press the, the seed to get the oil out and you can put that oil into your uh, engine if it's properly converted and, and it burns away. And so many farmers converted over to using the, the seed fuel. But certainly, uh, you know, Gulf Oil and, and all the new uh, oil and gas companies that were forming in the, the 1920s had a, a, a vested interest in eliminating the competition and making sure that hemp wasn't being used. And so, uh, the you know, pharmaceutical companies um, that were forming at the time weren't really a, a part of this conglomerate. They were quite new. But there, there were certainly other interests within the government and, and military that were working towards uh, a sort of pill-based uh, medicine uh, kind of uh, system and, uh, and turning you know, the plants that had been used in med as medicines in, into drugs that were marketable and patentable and again, you know, stopping people from using you know, either natural medicines or uh, you know, having access, you know, uh, easy access to these medicines because they're all protected and patented. Um, so these early you know, drug companies were also you know, 
right in there uh, looking to eliminate hemp. But it, it didn't happen right away. Um, it started in... You uh, just wait a second? Circle. Okay. Thank you. No pharmaceutical. You're just starting farm. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So it didn't all happen at once. Again, a lot of this was happening behind closed doors with different industries and rich people talking together. Um, and uh, in Canada here, we have a little bit different story than the, than the United States. Um, the United States was actually a lot more democratic and transparent at, at the time. The Canadian government, not so much. The Canadian government really uh, was was created by a small group of, of wealthy people and uh, hasn't been uh, accountable to the general population here even, even yet, really. But in the 1920s, uh, very little was known about what was happening in Ottawa and uh, the inner workings of it. And uh, the, the woman that we can blame for prohibition here in Canada, the prohibition of marijuana, uh, is actually uh, a Canadian hero for many people for, for completely different reasons. Uh, Emily Murphy uh, was the first female judge in the British magistrate, like, you know, and back at the time that would include like India and Pakistan and, and, and some pretty uh, large tracts of land around the world. She was the first female judge anywhere in the British Empire. Um, and uh, she really stood up for women's rights. Un unfortunately, she pissed on everybody else's, and she had some very racist views, um, some very um, harsh views about forced sterilization, and uh, uh, other things that, that in today's world we, we would consider quite abhorrent, um, including the uh, prohibition of, of marijuana. Uh, again, if you what, what she did was she printed a bunch of stories in, in McLean's magazine, essentially just regurgitating what was coming out of the Hearst newspaper company. So it wasn't even stories about anything happening in Canada. Uh, it was stories about things happening in LA and she was saying we needed to create these laws to stop blacks and Hispanics from hurting our girls and all this other crazy stuff. And uh, after publishing a series of articles in the Plains magazine, uh, she got a book put out. I thought I had it around, The Black Candle. And uh, the Black Candle um, really had a, an immediate effect. I think the year the Black Candle came out, 1923, was the year that the Canadian government very quickly, with absolutely no debate, passed uh, prohibition laws uh, of uh, cannabis. And uh, they were really strange in, in terms of how they were brought into effect. Um, they weren't really enforced very quickly in any sense. The medical community continued to use cannabis as, as medicine, it didn't stop. And farmers continued to grow and use hemp, but marijuana itself was made illegal in Canada. In the United States, they had to be a lot more subtle than that, and, and they had to take their time. And, and so they couldn't just come up with these laws and, and not be questioned about it. And so they, again, worked behind closed doors, and, and Andrew Mellon um, decided that he was going to form the Federal Bureau of and he put his uh, nephew, in law, Harry Hanslick, in charge of it. Now that is the agency that's now known as the FBI. And Harry Hanslick led the FBI for over four decades. I think he went from like 1926 to 1950 something. Like the guy just wouldn't quit and uh, was on a mission. And uh, it's kind of funny, but it explains something where Andrew Mellon rich American, he, he actually, uh, he went on, from, he uh, went from being the richest man in America, I think in 1923 he became the Secretary Treasurer for the United States government, because the U.S. they're all about money, right, so they figured that, you know, the richest guy should be the one in charge of the Treasury for the American government, so, uh, yeah, so that's how Andrew Mellon got to go and create an entire department for his, his, his nephew-in-law. And the story is that Andrew Mellon and his family had a lot of business interests, right? They were controlling a, a lot of different businesses. Um, and this guy, this asshole, essentially married into the family. And Harry Anslinger was not liked by the family at all. 
and in order to keep him out of the family business, they actually got him this job in government to essentially eliminate the family's competition in business. And so, uh, um, yeah, so Harry Anslinger um, wasn't liked even by his own family. And uh, he really went about uh, instilling the, these prohibition laws, not just in the United States, not just for cannabis, uh, but around the world. He, he's really um, single-handedly responsible for, for these laws more than, than anybody else by far. But he wasn't even able to do that right away. He was able to kind of go state to state, and he got certain states to make prohibition laws, um, but it wasn't something that he was able to convince the entire American government right away. Um, and so, uh, by the time, uh, and, and the other thing that happened was Andrew Mellon uh, went about seeing that hemp was taken out of the American economy as much as possible. So he did a number of certain things, uh, like within educational institutions, he had hemp written out of the textbooks. Um, in uh, the armies and navies, he stopped buying hemp, uh, if at all possible. Um, and so the clothing was replaced, uh, you know, rope was replaced uh, with nylon rope. That was one of the things DuPont Chemicals was coming out with, was, was nylon rope. And, and it's not as good for sailboats. When it freezes, it, it breaks up uh, and uh, it's uh, not, not as good as the, the hemp. But nylon was being promoted uh, as uh, you know, the, uh, the replacement for hemp and for clothing. It would last longer and stuff. They didn't, talked about the fact that it would last forever until it broke down and little birds choked on it, but uh, it was uh, you know, promoted as we have all these new age products and uh, we don't need hemp anymore, we've got nicer, shinier things. And so um, hemp was slowly eliminated uh, and farmers were growing less and uh, Andrew Mellon made sure that there's no research and development being done into hemp anymore and so uh, they... Uh, eliminated you know anything that was being done into genetics research or product research or you know any kind of business to do with hemp you would never get any money from the United States government for it um, and they made sure among the food industries that like no trace amounts of hemp were being used in any of the products so that it was it was eliminated from that. so by 1937 by the time they actually created the marijuana tax act, um, hemp was only being used in a couple of places um, and uh, really not much for fiber at all anymore. Um, in fact, uh, when the law was, was brought up for debate in the United States government, there was only two groups uh, that opposed the uh, elimination of cannabis. Uh, although the, the hemp farmers were really um, taken aback by this. And, and it was a really funny law because the Marijuana Tax Act, it, it's just that. They didn't actually uh, prohibit it, but they said there's a $100 tax per ounce of marijuana. And for hemp farmers, that was just completely ridiculous because $100 uh, an ounce for their fields would have been you know, in, the, in the thousands of dollars, possibly millions for some of them. And... Uh, hundred dollars back then was a hell of a lot of money. It wasn't a small uh, amount. Today it's a lot of money. Back then it, it was probably you know the equivalent of over a thousand. <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't practical at all. But uh, the the only two groups that opposed it were the American Medical Association. It was actually a very passionate speech that's still available uh, by the president of the American Medical Association in 1937 who complained that they had no warning that this was happening, that it, it was only made, uh, brought to their attention in, in the last you know, weeks or months before the, the law was passed, that the Marijuana Tax Act actually affected cannabis because that tax upon medicine was you know, far too restrictive. Uh, even $100 an ounce back then for pot was just simply outrageous, uh, especially for the quality of this. And so, uh, um, the, the American Medical Association complained because there were some uh, problems for which they had few, if any, drugs that would work. Uh, glaucoma being the most commonly used um, problem that uh, cannabis was used for. 
and the doctors would routinely prescribe uh, cannabis for glaucoma. In fact, it's my understanding that even into the 1950s, a number of doctors would actually either grow it themselves or, or know other people that grew cannabis. So they'd have a jar of it in their, their offices, and if somebody came with glaucoma, they had like virtually nothing else for them. It's like, you have glaucoma, oh, you're going blind. Like, sorry about your luck, unless you try smoking this one plant, you know? But by the 1950s, the American government had really clamped down enough on doctors, they, they weren't even willing to risk that anymore. Uh, but the American Medical Association, you know, screamed bloody murder at the idea that this was uh, being done, that, that this was, to them was, was one of the safest, uh, most effective medicines that, that, that they knew, and that there was no scientific justification for this law. In fact, in, in nowhere than the United States, Canada, Britain, nowhere that these laws were brought into effect was there any you know, anything even close to scientific evidence and nothing more than, again, exaggerated, unsupported stories that were just told to, to create uh, you know, kind of inflammatory situations. And so uh, in, in the American government as well, even with these presentations, uh, n no one uh, um, debated even the matter, let alone uh, because there, there was very little to debate it seemed. Um, the other group, though, that did oppose the Marijuana Tax Act was uh, poultry farmers. Uh, apparently, birds love hemp seed. Um, in fact, it's canaries, right? Canaries will not sing unless they have hemp seed. That's what they eat to sing. Uh, or, you know, it, it, the difference is, is dramatic compared to... Uh, That's why uh, a lot of bird seed has had uh, hemp seed in it, and the, 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 the poultry farmers are actually able to do one thing that turned out to be, you know, really quite important, and that they argued that the birds, especially for eggs, I guess as well, like uh, even poultry eggs, like uh, if you feed your birds uh, hemp seed, the eggs that they produce will just be huge, full of yolk. Oh. They can tell the difference if it's been irradiated too. Yeah, but they'll eat them anyway. Won't they? They won't sing with the irradiated hemp seed. They'll eat them, but they won't sing. <laughs> okay, well, apparently, um, and, and that is important because uh, the seed, the, the poultry farmers argued that they had to have the seed. There's no good reason not to have the seed. Um, but the United States government uh, forced them to sterilize it by irradiation, uh, most, most commonly, um, to have it imported into the United States. And so uh, a lot of the bird seed that is sold has hemp seed in it, but they've been zapped with radiation so that they're not uh, able to germinate anymore. And so uh, the United States government did allow for the import of hemp products, but uh, not for the actual production of them in the United States. And uh, like I say, that, that was important uh, because a lot of activists in the United States uh, really turned on to this uh, in part because they got a hold of hemp seeds and started eating them and began to learn more about uh, the, the plant uh, through the use of the seeds. <laughs> but yeah, so in 1937, uh, it, it was really quite a shock to, to the farming community more than anybody that these laws were brought in. Um, and it was such a surprise that Popular Mechanics, um, which was one of the largest publications in the States at the time, had a front page feature article on hemp, uh, the title being New Billion Dollar Crop. The first time billion dollars had been applied to any agricultural crop at all. So it was really quite uh, dramatic for them to say that there's this new billion dollar crop. Um, ironically, um, they didn't know that it had just been made virtually illegal in the Marijuana Tax Act when that publication came out. And uh, it's, it's really quite fascinating to go look back at, at the McLean story, or sorry, the uh, popular mechanics story, um, in part because it talks a lot about Henry Ford. Uh, Henry Ford was a firm believer in the hemp plant, and uh, right through the 1930s, he had uh, engines that were burning hemp fuel, and there's this really wicked video, if you ever get to see it, where he made the fiberglass on this car out of hemp, because uh, you can take the, the stock and uh, break it up and make fiberglass. In fact, in Alberta, there's an electric car with hemp body uh, being made right now. There's small numbers, but uh, anyway, there's this wicked video of Henry Ford taking a sledgehammer to the, the front of this car 
and the the car the, the sledgehammer just bouncing off of the car and i think there's one point where he actually manages to dent the car and then he just kind of goes on the inside and hits it a little bit and it just pops back into place and so uh the the hemp uh you know uh, fiberglass that, that was available back then was, was really you know cutting edge material as well and so uh henry ford was featured in this uh popular mechanics article and they're talking about the use of hemp as fuel because the idea was that farmers by growing hemp could produce the fuel they need for their vehicles uh, they could burn the fuel to produce electricity for their homes and their, their barns the leftover mash from the seed could be used to feed animals because it's so high in protein essential amino acids and stuff it's just incredibly good for your, your animals and then uh, you would have the stock that you'd be able to sell onto the open marketplace and uh, the fiber the, the leaf that you would put back into the ground to help uh, regenerate the ground and so uh, it was promoted uh, again as, as you know, the, the most valuable crop uh, in, in America um, but that crashed uh, you know, right around the time it was it was put in print uh, it became apparent that uh, this new tax was, was going to kill the industry <laughs> And, and it effectively did for a short time um, until ironically the military needed hemp again because uh, the Second World War started up uh, pretty soon after uh, hemp was made illegal and it turns out that when producing not only rope but even the canvas used in parachutes uh, there's nothing quite as, as tough and versatile and useful as hemp and so uh, they were trying to make a whole bunch of parachutes to, to get into Germany and the cheapest and best fiber to do that was hemp. And so uh, just years after it was virtually made illegal, the United States government uh, came out with the Hemp for Victory campaign. And uh, they were trying to convince farmers, I think it started in 1943, uh, to grow hemp for the war. And uh, it suddenly became a really important thing for the United States government that uh, farmers were, were growing hemp and, and, and it was this really strange uh, time period because it really only lasted for about two seasons and then all of a sudden the war was over and all of a sudden the United States government just shut down the entire program and suddenly hemp was uh, illegal again. Um, and so uh, it, it was a, a real kind of strange historical anomaly um, that the, the Hemp for Victory campaign came on, but it just proves you know, how uh, ignorant the government was in making it illegal in the first place. And uh, you know, it's, it's something that uh, unfortunately uh, wasn't able to, to stick. And uh, again, shortly after the war, uh, the prohibition of hemp and, and cannabis uh, became enforced even more. decades that hemp has not been available in the United States. Um, although, uh, because it was allowed to be imported, a lot of people heard about it. And uh, the, the history, while it was, was almost erased, wasn't entirely destroyed. And so, uh, in the 1970s, uh, a man in California, Jack Hare, um, put together a collection of information. Uh, he got a book published in 1986, The Emperor Wears No Clothes which uh, t tells this, this story that I've talked about today about you know, why hemp was made illegal uh, and it's, it's not only a sad story because you know, hemp is such a wonderful plant but it's, it's also really sad what, what the alternatives to it have been if, if, if it had been uh, eliminated for more or, or as equally as uh, healthy environmentally uh, plants and, and products then that might not be such a sad thing but what has happened here is that the most versatile, the most useful, the, the fastest growing plant in the world ha has been taken out for a whole bunch of more harmful processes and chemicals and products that, that really in the long run make, make our lives and our planet's uh, life a, a lot more of a struggle. And, and so uh, it's, it's been uh, a, a really uh, sad uh, story to, to have to tell over and over on why this plant was made illegal so people could profit more and create a pillager plant and cut down trees to, to their propaganda. But uh, uh, this is 
this is what it is. But the, the fact is that now uh, we, we know this history, we can share this history, and, and we know that, that this plant can uh, produce most of our basic human needs, our building materials, our foods, uh, our fuels, our plastics, you know, paints, uh, almost everything we need can come from this, this incredible plant. And so I think learning the, the history of it uh, helps in, in understanding how we got here and, and